Welcome to Massive Passive Cash Flow, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Welcome back to the Massive Passive Cash Flow podcast. I'm Gary Wilson, your host. I'm so glad to have you back listening or watching, if that's the case, to the podcast. We've got an excellent guest today, Joe Presti, and he's uh, an excellent subject. If you have built a business in your life, and many of you have, uh, Joe's one of the kind of people you want to speak to when it comes to what are your future plans? Because just like real estate people say, hey, your house is your biggest investment. I, I don't agree with that, by the way. Um, but if you built a business, it probably is your biggest thing that you've done. So you really want to have the right information, the right education, and Joe's is one of the people that can give that to you. So, so Joe, now that I've made your head really big, <laughs> um, I want to... I want to personally thank you for doing this. I, I love the subject. It's it's so vitally important to many of our clients. And I appreciate the fact that you're taking your time to help us. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Gary. Yeah. Hey, if you don't mind, I always like to start off with a little bit of background. And the reason is, is I find it fascinating that most of us are not doing what we were, said we were going to do when we were in grade school. We thought we were going to be you know, <laughs> doctors and dentists and astronauts and stuff. But take us through... What led you to this part of your life, this business part of your life? Was there a pivotal moment, an introduction, inspiration, or something that happened personally to you? If you don't mind sharing how that started, that would be great, you know? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so I've uh, I've been in the uh, wealth management industry for 39 years now, started in 1985. Um you know, at the beginning of my career, I was working for some of the big brokerage companies and, um, you know, fairly quickly realized that they were going to teach me how to sell, but not necessarily how to be a good advisor and how to help my clients achieve their goals. Um, so that sales culture didn't resonate with me. I transitioned uh, fairly early to being an independent advisor about a quarter of a century ago and uh, started Arlington Wealth Management in 2000. So we're, you know, in our, our 24th year. Um, and, you know, having that independence of being able to, um, you know, kind of carve my own path and uh, do things my way that I, that I think helps my clients was really why I set out on starting my own company and uh, developing my own strategies on the investment side. I did that for many years and we still use those, those proactive strategies today in the investment management part of our business. But as our clients became wealthier, um, we realized that investment management was just, you know, one piece of the silo of what they need. Uh, they needed a lot more advanced wealth planning that you know covers um, cash flow planning to fund their lifestyle, tax mitigation strategies, uh, uh, wealth transfer strategies to take care of their heirs and loved ones, you know how to protect their assets from um, you know from various catastrophic risks and uh, and a lot of other uh, uh, things as well. So that that's what brought me to where I am today and uh, mostly working with business owners, and coordinating their wealth planning, personal wealth planning with the business strategy to make sure it all fits to achieve their goals. Yeah. And there is a, it, it, you know, it could seem, I imagine it could seem quite complex to people who are in that sphere, you know, they built the business, their families involved, usually in a lot of cases. Um, but when they look at all the options available to them, a lot of times they don't realize how many options are available. I'm I'm one of those people. So what what should a business owner be thinking about if they really want to maximize, you know, monetize the business value and maximize their personal wealth, like just in the next few years, you know? Yeah. Well, that uh, you know that I think there's five key things that a business owner should be thinking about. Um, and I can either go into detail in each five now or just kind of list them and then we could, you know, circle back and, and cover each of them in, in more detail. The, you know, we'll just let the conversation yeah. flow, flow as it will. But designing okay. a personal action plan is, I think, the number one thing that a business owner should do. Um, and what that involves is looking at 
what the, what the ultimate transition, succession, or sale, whatever that is for each business owner, what that's going to look like for them. And this is where they could kind of design that exit on their terms, right? As opposed to letting that, letting the design, letting somebody else design their exit. Uh, so who are the potential buyers? What will they look for in your company? Who is your ideal buyer? Is it private equity? Is it a strategic buyer? Is it an industry consolidator? Will you transition it to family or uh, you know, internally to key employees? Uh, is an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, an option? Uh, what will your role in the company be uh, or, or look like? Uh, are you going to be involved? If so, what does that look like? Will you be a consultant or uh, will it be a short um, a transition? Will, will it be a little bit more lengthy? Um, and then what will your life look like? You know, what are you going to okay. do for most founding business owners? Their business is their identity. It's what they're most proud of, um, sometimes more so than their own children. And mm -hmm. if they've been building that business, you know, for years or, or perhaps even decades, you know, what will your legacy look like with the employees, the customers, the community you've operated in for, for all those years? So all those things can be determined by the owner through a personal action plan. Um, okay. Okay. And, and, okay. And this is the part of the process that where they could mm -hmm. design the terms when the exit's about them later in the process, when you get to the selling part or the succession part, you're going to find yeah. it's mostly about the buyer. You know, and, yeah. and how they could continue growing the business, how they could generate a return on investment to justify the purchase price. Very little of that transaction process is about the owner. It's in that pre-sale action mm -hmm. planning that they could define the terms of their of their their exit. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, that sounds like a that's probably a, <laughs> if you have that nailed, probably everything else. Is going to be a lot more successful. So, so in your business model in Arlington Wealth Management, um, I, I guess when someone approaches you or introduced to you, uh, is there a, like a proactive planning team? Of um, is there a virtual family office? How how, uh, um, how can the business owners achieve their most important goals working with you? Is if, what does that look like for someone? Like say, let's take a dentist who's been we, with the quote unquote, the phrase is being fr fearful of being stuck behind the chair, which means they're going to be <laughs> 65 still performing dental services. But really, they probably have a valuable business. But what does that actually, what does that process look like? Uh, how does it start? Um, what are the steps uh, to engage with you? You know? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a, a proactive planning team, and that's that's one of the five key things I think a business owner should be. Um, thinking about if they want to monetize the business value and maximize their personal wealth. So designing that personal action plan, I think, is a starting point. Um, to do that, it really helps to work with experienced uh, advisors that have helped business owners go through this process before. Um, you know, a proactive planning team, I think, is one of those five key concepts, too, of working with a proactive planning team. In my experience with wealth management, uh, what I've seen is how costly it can be for business owners to work with different advisors who don't communicate with each other. And that's why a proactive planning team is so important, right? You could try to yeah. form one on your own with your key advisors, or you could work with a team that's already formed. Um, yeah. forming, one, forming one on your own is is difficult. I, I will tell you it's difficult. I've seen how like a wealth manager and an accountant is there's going to be obstacles there. There's going to be barriers if they're not already working with each other. And each one is going to have their ego, right? They want to be in control. They want to look like right. the smartest in the room. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, it becomes very difficult. Working with a team that's already formed, if you could find one, is, is I think ideal because they are already collaborating, they're already communicating, the barriers are already gone, and they're 
working, uh, you know, the discussions about you and how they could bring, let's say it's an accountant and a financial advisor, how they could bring these, uh, their own siloed uh, advice and make it synergistic and coordinate it to bring better results for you. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, it's interesting you say that because I, I see that a lot in real estate. We have clients who started off just, you know, buying duplexes and things like that, and then five plexes and then 20. Next thing you know, they've <clears throat> 20 years later, they've got a you know portfolio of hundreds of units in multiple asset classes. And they're in their mind, they're thinking, well, I can just sell and cash out. But just like in your in your business model, the real estate specific muscle model there is a lot of ways to skin that cat you can create a REIT real estate investment trust that that you create it buys your properties so you still control the assets but you've literally capitalized on them right and you can still yeah. manage the assets through a property management company just one example but but back to back to your your model though you mentioned the people that can do it on their own i'm willing to bet that the people that try it on their own a large percentage of them probably realize a year or so later, darn it, I, I wish I didn't do that. <laughs> I mean, what is the what? What would you say is um, why do why do most of them regret that? The ones that really aren't, they they're trying to do it themselves. For example, they they don't know what the options are. You know. Yeah. Well, I think there's a <clears throat> excuse me. There's a few reasons. One is it's hard to find the best talent in different fields, right? You need. Mm -hmm. You, you probably need a, a financial advisor or a wealth manager, your, your accountant, your attorney, business consultants you're working with, risk mitigation, the insurance um, agents uh, or, or, or advisors that you're working with. Um, and then the time that's involved for you to have to meet with the accountant and get their advice and meet with the financial advisor and get their advice. And then you have to be the quarterback to make sure that this is all fitting together and then, you know, it, it is the legal advice uh, uh, being coordinated with the accounting advice, for example, all that is is very delicate in many cases. And of course, there's different levels of complexity for each business owner, depending on their specific situation. Uh, but, you know, getting that siloed advice where the accountant gives you their advice on tax and uh, uh, you know, payroll or 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 bookkeeping, whatever their sphere is, and the financial advisors talking about your personal wealth plans, but not necessarily thinking about the business strategy. And is that in coordination with their advice? Uh, you know, all of that can be really open up more and better opportunities. And um, there's missed opportunities when you're getting that siloed advice as opposed to working with that proactive planning team that knows yeah. you, right? And knows what you, where you are now, where you're trying to go, what your your values and goals are, and then can coordinate a strategy uh, considering all aspects of your finances around that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I agree. When you're, you, 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 we don't know what we don't know. And that's why it's always great. <laughs> Yeah, be in a network and work with people, multiple backgrounds that can. That's why we have boards of directors, maybe because you get you get the in, input from people with different backgrounds and seeing things you're not seeing. It doesn't mean you're not smart. I mean, they're not seeing everything in their business either. But that's why you collaborate with some of the greatest thinkers in modern times. You know, Henry Ford, Harvey Firestone, right? You know, Edison. They all met. Every, I think, three times a year, by the way, down in Sarasota, Florida, <laughs> to mastermind, to get together and help each other out and solve problems. And they were in different industries, you know? So yeah. a, lot to, a lot to be said for that. Um, there, there, something there that's kind of in the, yeah, something in the background here that keeps popping up is I'm gathering people wouldn't be having these discussions either amongst themselves or even with you and, and your group if they hadn't reached the point in life where they're able to. And that's, I, I, you've, you've, Refer to it as the freedom point. Uh, if you could talk about that a little bit, like the freedom point, and then how does someone, a follow-up question would be, how do you know how sellable a business is? I mean, like a barbershop with just one guy cutting hair, that's completely different than a barbershop where there's five people cutting hair. But I, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but really the, yeah. the freedom point. And then how do you know 
if what you have is syllable, is there a scale or a, 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 a ratio or a factor, you know? Yeah. No, these, these are, uh, these are great questions and they're really going down right where I think my five key points are that a business owner should be focusing on. Okay. And so I'm just going to list them and then we'll, I'll circle back to answer your questions. One, design that personal action plan where you could, you could design the exit on your terms. Two, determine your freedom point. And that's the question you just asked. I'll, I'll circle back to exactly what I mean there. Three, know your sellability score, right? And that's very different than how a business owner tends to measure their business. And I'll explain that in a minute. Four, you want to coordinate your pre-sale wealth planning with the business strategy. Don't just sell the business and then try to figure it out later. You're missing opportunities mm -hmm. by not focusing on pre-sale wealth management. And then number five is work with that proactive planning team that we just talked a little bit about. Um, so going back to the freedom point, to me, this is a huge concept because Business owners value personal freedom above everything else. That's why you started your business. So you could call the shots. And that's why the freedom point concept is so crucial to understand. So the freedom point is when you've accumulated enough wealth, uh, whether it's inside your business or outside or you know combination of the two typically of, of savings as well as business uh, enterprise value, You've accumulated enough to do whatever you want, whenever you want, of course, within the bounds of reason. Uh, you know, living a lavish lifestyle or, you know, you know, buying an island or something crazy like that is not yeah. really what you're talking <laughs> about. But living your ideal life unbothered by financial constraints. And it's more mm -hmm. than just funding your lifestyle, you know, in per perpetuity. It's, it's about securing mm -hmm. your freedom of time. Uh, you know, how you're spending your time, your relationships, who you're spending your time with, and purpose, how you how you are able to live your life and you know the values and 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 purpose that that you see in, in life. And of course, it's about freedom of money too, but really freedom of money drives the freedom of time, relationships, and and purpose. Uh, so knowing yeah. that freedom point is is hugely important uh, to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I have, a, I have one of my favorite quotes by Henry David Thoreau. He said that wealth is the ability to fully experience life. Uh, and, and that's what the freedom mm -hmm. point, I think, really encompasses, is that ability to experience yeah. your ideal life. Did you know that you can participate in class every Monday? We call it Monday Night Live, 7 p.m. Eastern, with me and dozens of other investor agents from around the country, in fact, the world. Every Monday, totally free. No selling, no recruiting, just straight up education on anything and everything in real estate. And we have a lot of good guests coming up once or twice a month, bringing in expertise on subjects like how to buy a house with crypto. Okay. How about them apples? What, what about AI? How is AI affecting our business? How about the metaverse? Blockchain processing. We're already using it in title work. So, so come on to Monday Night Live. Be ready to take notes and ask questions because it's live and engaging and you get to participate by asking questions and meeting others. So we'll see you there. Uh, go to Gary, realestatewithgarywilson.com, click on the resource tab, drop down, and you'll see Monday Night Live. And in there, you can see one of the most recent classes. But more importantly, you can register for class as many as you want going up to like the end of the year, I believe. So in any case, uh, do that. We'll see you on Monday Night Live. Look forward to meeting you in person. Take care. Yeah, it's interesting. I've got right here, you can't see it, but on the sidewall, the four seasons, the Henry David Thoreau and his, his messages for, you know, spring, summer, fall, and winter is kind of interesting. <laughs> so, um, now as far as the sellability, like there, well, there's, there's yeah. really a couple of things here. How, how do you know how sellable it is, but then also how do you calculate the value, you know? Right. Well, there, there are different ways to do that. Uh, but, you know, I like to talk about a sellability score. Um, so different people are going to value a business in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. For owners like us, our business is priceless. It's everything to us. You know, we built it maybe from the ground up. We founded it years and years ago. But buyers look at things differently. They focus on specific metrics that go beyond just making money and are most likely much different than the way you measure your business. 
So mm -hmm. a buyer is going to look at things like how dependent the business is on you. Right? A company that depends heavily on the owner isn't as valuable to a buyer unless you plan on working for them. Right? And not too many business owners want to work for somebody else, or at least not for a long period of time. They'll look at what your competitive advantage is. What is your unique ability that differentiates your company from its competitors? And then mm -hmm. that could, could be very valuable to a strategic buyer that can take your competitive advantage and offer it to a larger existing customer base, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll look at recurring revenue streams. The predictability of recurring revenue streams is comforting to a buyer that could you know, be a cushion against a downturn or unexpected things. And it's just very, you know, comforting to know that they don't have to start at zero every month or every year, uh, that there's, mm -hmm. you know, recurring revenues coming in. And if you look at the world today, you know, we're all, we're in the membership economy. That's a great book. If you've, if you've not uh, you had a chance to read that one, the membership economy, think about how many okay. memberships we have today compared to 10 years ago. Right, my credit yeah. card bill is is filled with all the memberships, both for my business as well as personally. So businesses around the world have figured out how yeah. to get that recurring revenue, and and it's a very valuable thing to a buyer. So those are the types of metrics a buyer will look at, and I've identified eight key metrics like that that are important to buyers um, from their perspective that really determine your sellability score. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's important to know your score today and which areas you can improve your score to increase your business value in the eyes of that buyer. Okay. Hey, uh, now, when it comes to the um, partly your business, but also the folk, the business of folks you're working with, uh, what what's the role, if you could explain the role of a personal chief financial officer in a business owner's life, and yeah. then... You know, really, um, and we touched on this already, but the, the virtual family office experts, you know, uh, are there different role players for different purposes? So kind of a kind of a um, two part question there. And they really what is first off, what is the role of the personal chief financial officer? Um, and, I'm, you know, yeah. I would encourage everybody to to, again, not try to do this on your own, guys. It's too, there's too much at stake, too much potential positive that you may be overlooking when you're, when you're, and, and entrepreneurs are famous for trying to do it on our own, you know? We yeah. Do our own. But therein lies the dilemma, you know? So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the personal chief financial officer is the advisor on your proactive planning team, right? So think about that, that advisory team. Most mm -hmm. often my experience is working with an accountant and myself being the wealth manager, and we're the frontline proactive planning team. And one of those two, either the accountant or myself, is the personal chief financial officer for the business owner. They're mm -hmm. the person that advocates for you. Now, you may have a CFO for your business, but they're thinking about your business. They're not thinking about how your business strategy coordinates with your personal aspirations and, and, and wealth planning. So the personal chief financial officer is going to advocate for you from everything surrounding your personal wealth planning and everything surrounding your business strategy that it fits in with your personal plans, right? They're going to be your advocate. Mm -hmm. They're going to bring opportunities to your attention that you currently don't know about. They're going to make sure you're not missing something critical in your own thinking. And importantly, mm -hmm. they're going to make sure there are no gaps in the planning, that there isn't that siloed approach to the planning where the uh, the tax strategy is not in coordination with the investment strategy and not in coordination with the uh, exit strategy of, of the business. So that's what the personal chief financial officer is going to be. Probably the person you're talking to the most on your advisory team. Mm -hmm. And that, that personal uh, CFO is going to they're 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 going to want to have a deep bench behind them, mm -hmm. right? And that's that virtual family office you alluded to that earlier in the conversation. Mm -hmm. No one person or even small team can you know, no matter how knowledgeable and talented they are, they don't have all the answers, right? So yeah. 
that frontline team is going to know you, what you're trying to accomplish, and probably be able to handle you know, 60, 70, 80% of your planning needs. But when you have need niche expertise, the virtual family office is the deep punch. And that's a team of expert advisors that have niche expertise that the, the team can bring into the relationship and be able to uh, provide a solution for any of your niche concerns that you may have. And we could get okay. into you know who that looks like and what type of experts that looks like, if you like. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting is I'm gathering it partly because of the the, the new economy and then in the fact that we can, and, well, the, the pandemic brought it all to light. We can really operate with anyone, anywhere, from anywhere. So does it matter where someone is? I mean, I'm assuming most of your clients are U.S.-based, but, but uh, can you serve people from like Canada? We have a lot of Canadians that we work with, too. I, I used to I used to live in Canada. But are they mainly U.S. based, and does it matter geographically where they are and wherever you are to be able to, to work together? Well, most of our clients are U.S. based. Um, we work with uh, you know clients all over the country. Um, mm -hmm. There are some uh, you know security regulations about working with uh, you know with, with um, citizens of other countries. We could consult with them from a business standpoint, but it's more difficult to work with them on their investments. Uh, but yeah. as far as the team, the team could be anywhere. And you're absolutely right. The pandemic really accelerated um, this virtual uh, concept. Mm -hmm. So the virtual part of the family office, you know, wealthy families, people who sell businesses for, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, they tend to form their own family office, right? Where they, they hire their own team, their own accountant, their own advisor, their own attorneys, their, you know, people that handle their personal needs, their travel plans, paying their bills, uh, you know, real estate manager, whatever it is, they have their own team that does it. Well, most of our clients don't have that amount of wealth. They're just below it. But collectively, okay. they do. Uh, so mm -hmm. assembling a virtual family office, which is a team of 75 niche experts in advanced tax strategy, um, mm -hmm. uh, wealth management, risk management, legal legal. Um, business advisory. These are nationwide experts that are, yeah. you know, among the best and brightest in in the country. In fact, in the world, for that matter, that we have available to us to be able to bring in to a client uh, relationship if one of their you know levels of expertise can can solve a problem for them. Okay. Now, how about? Um, I know we're going to get short on time here very quickly. <laughs> I sh I've, we may have to do another podcast too, but as far yeah. as timing, um, most people don't think of these things until they're you know in their their you know late fifties, maybe early sixties. But is there? It, I mean, again, I'll go back to the dentist. I just, just they're easy to pick on, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but they get out of college, right? Some of them get a, a business line and a credit right out of the gate, depending on what state they're in, up to a million dollars. Heart blanche, or they have the a million dollars to, to, to help them launch their business. They grow the business. Maybe by the time they're retired, they got three or four or five practices. But is it better for them to actually think about this early on as they're growing their business, or what, how does timing play into all this um, planning for that that big move, the the exit strategy? You know. Yeah. Um, uh, well, certainly the earlier the better. Um, you know, business owners are in different stages of their career and, and growth path and um, uh, business plans. Um, so we tend to work with business owners that are in two phases. One is in that uh, beginning to think about the the transition, the exit, uh, and and planning for, for that. The second is the business owner that wants to grow. So in either case, mm -hmm. I think it's just very important for them to think about how to coordinate their personal wealth planning around the business strategy. If it's exit related or transition related, there's a whole you know whole bunch of different uh, concepts that they need to be thinking about that we've talked a lot about in you know in, in today's discussion. Um, if they're okay. growth focused, it still makes sense for them to think about how that growth strategy fits in with their personal wealth planning. It could be a lot of right. different concerns and solutions 
but we still want to coordinate it all as opposed to have it kind of run piecemeal and just hope that it all works out in the end. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I'd, I'd love to take a few moments if we could just to talk about uh, the book you wrote and the, yeah, I believe I have a website, exitbydesignbook.com. Um, you know, I guess people can visit the site, but what can they, what should they look for when they're there? And what are some of the things that are uh, key topics in the book? I know we probably discussed a lot of them here, but uh, I want to, I want to, I want to promote your book because you're the first person I've met who's actually written a book on this. And every, everybody who builds a business needs to have this information. I mean, you're, you're sort of like the Pied Piper right now, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, I wrote a book. I co-authored co it with my daughter, Marissa, um, who works with me in our wealth management company. And uh, we just found that there's a huge void in the advice that business owners are receiving. Uh, again, not, you know, to, to repeat, they're receiving siloed advice from their accountant that's restricted to their professional silo, their attorney, their financial advisor, and anybody else, business consultants, et cetera. And we think that there's huge missed opportunities that uh, business owners uh, are, are seeing because their advice is not being coordinated. Their advisors are not collaborating. There aren't synergies to the advice. And it's not all considering what their personal dreams and values are. Uh, so we wrote a book about it because we think that there is a void in the market uh, uh, surrounding this, just as as, as you stated. Uh, Exit by Design is the name of the book. Exitbydesign.com is the website. Any listener, uh, we, we'd offer a free ebook or video book uh, if you go to the website and you could download it there. Um, and uh, and many of the concepts we talked about in today's conversation are, are in the book. You know, we kind of break it down to two two big sections. One is the business strategy section, and that's developing the personal action plan for the business owner, determining your freedom point, um, maximizing your business value through the sellability score, and then the personal wealth planning. The pre-sale wealth planning is really the crust of it. We think that most most business owners sadly do not focus on pre-sale wealth planning uh, because they're too focused okay. on the business and, and the transaction. Um, and then the post-sale wealth planning and the, the, the value of using the proactive planning team and, and the team having a deep bench with a virtual family office of experts. Okay. Okay, good. And then the, the website, arlingtonwealth.com, that's a... Uh, is that where I mean? Is that the best way for people to engage with you? Go there, and there's a way they can um, leave contact information and so forth. Uh, yes, their uh, Arlington-Wealth.com is, uh, oh, okay. is a website, right? So that's my company's website. Um, and yes, okay. there they could you know schedule a phone call if they wanted to talk or read. Obviously, find out more information about our company and and the types of services that we provide. The types of cl mm -hmm. clients that we work with, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I just I, I love the whole subject, and I, I one of the things I love about being in America, and I'm not saying you can't build businesses in Europe and Asia and so forth. You certainly can, but here in the in the Great Recession, and I can't remember the exact numbers, Joe, but um, corporate America was responsible for the loss of something like 8 million jobs during those years, you know, layoffs and so forth. And I get it. I'm, I'm in business and you've got to cut expenses. But small business owners, entrepreneurs, and startups were responsible for the growth, the addition of more than 2 million jobs in the same time frame. You know, there's a lot of businesses out there in all walks of life, you know, food, entertainment, housing, you know, yes. medical, dental, you know, physical therapy. It just it goes on and on. And it's so there's a lot of people that need this help and need these services. So everybody listening, just please remember um, Arlington-Wealth.com. Go online, check it out, and have a conversation with Joe and his daughter. And then the book, ExitByDesignBook.com. Get the book. I am. <laughs> and I, I know exactly one other person in this business, and this was the first. And Joe's the first I met who actually wrote a book on the subject. So you're going to the right person. Um, and Joe... Thank you for doing this. I, I know you, you're very busy, and I know uh, how lucky we are to have you 
spend your time with us. I think a lot of people got a lot of value out of the day. Any, any final words of wisdom, something? I always like to ask this question. Could have been something your grandfather taught you or a, a favorite you know, teacher <laughs> at university that maybe, uh, maybe left a lasting impression on you, you know? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And thanks for having me today. And just to your point about the, you know, business owners and, you know, the, the jobs from corporate America versus small businesses. I think the pandemic just accelerated all that uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but, you know, my, my last thought for today is if you don't design your exit, uh, one will be designed for you. Every yeah. business owner is going to transition out of their business one day. Uh, so be proactive about it. You design it on your terms and you won't regret it later. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, one of the big reasons is the taxes. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, you're not able to use the tax code to your benefit. The tax code is written to be used in a lot of cases by business owners. So this is a big part of that, folks. Make sure you pay attention, listen, gather information, you know, talk to Joe and and, and follow the steps, follow the five steps to make a plan. But in the meantime, you guys take care of yourselves, Joe, you and your family too. God bless you and your families. We will see you on the next Massive Passive Cashflow podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Massive Passive Cashflow. Be sure to go to realestatewithgarywilson.com to join our community and start building wealth today.